Squared.com. Our first speaker for the motion is a British-born journalist and author, and now a columnist for the New York Times and International Herald Tribune. He has in the past strongly supported attempts to negotiate with Iran rather than confront it. But following the election of 2009, which was so widely seen as fraudulent, he admitted that he had erred in underestimating the brutality and cynicism of a regime that understands the uses of ruthlessness. So why does he now see Iran as a paper tiger? Here is Roger Cohen. Thank you very much, Richard. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let's make clear at the outset what this debate is not about. It's not about the Islamic Republic's abject human rights record or its intermittent brutality against its own people. There is no debate about that. As Richard just noted, I was in Tehran for two weeks after the tumultuous June 2009 election. In fact, I was one of the last Western reporters out of there. And I will never forget the bravery of Iranian men and women, especially the women, confronting the thugs of the regime and demanding that their votes be counted. Iran's centennial quest for representative government continues as a Brezhnevian supreme leader, Ali Khamenei, invokes the prophet and his sidekicks make prophets. No, ladies and gentlemen, nobody in this room, I suspect, thinks the Islamic Republic is nice. I certainly don't. But that's not our issue tonight. The question before us is whether Iran is a real threat to Europe, the US, Israel, or indeed anyone beyond Iran's borders, or whether, as I will argue, it's a puffed up knave full of bombast, manipulative, unforthcoming, brilliant at ambiguity, breathtaking at inertia, a regime with a tired ideology bent above all on survival, in short, a paper tiger. Now, the Iran threat industry is a large and mature one. I know, bearded mullahs with nukes rumble around in your subconscious. They don't feel cuddly, do they? The, the Iran menace background is there, a constant noise. Just listen, quote, Iran is the center of terrorism, fundamentalism, and subversion, and is in my view more dangerous than Nazism because Hitler did not possess a nuclear weapon whereas the Iranians are trying to perfect a nuclear option. Netanyahu, 2010? No, guess again. That was Shimon Peres, now Israeli president, back in 1996, 15 years ago. Ehud Barak, now Israel's defense minister, said in 1996 Iran would have nukes by 2004. Now Israel's ex-spy master is saying 2014, maybe. Maybe, well, pigs will fly, maybe. Before I get to the mystery of why this nuclear program has lumbered along for decades without reaching an endpoint, well, remember, the Pakistani nuclear program went from zero to a bomb in 10 years. A word about the nature of the Iranian regime. I'm sure you'll hear a lot from our opponents tonight about how aggressive or even apocalyptical, Netanyahu's phrase, the Islamic Republic is. Well, it's been around for 31 years. And like most survivors, it's endured through prudence. The Islamic Republic was attacked by Saddam Hussein with the West's backing and the West's chemical weapons in the 1980s. And then it ended that war through compromise. More recently, as we all know, there's been war in Afghanistan to the east and Iraq to the west, but not in Iran. Khamenei, the supreme leader, is the guardian of the revolution that's his title. He's in the preservation game, which is a risk-averse business. Oh, sure, he's billed as leader of the Muslim world, but have you ever heard him talking about the Muslim Chechens or the Muslim Uyghurs in China? No, because caution, cautious strategic calculation, dictates that Iran cannot alienate Russia and China. Nuclear ambiguity, nuclear models stand within the bounds of acceptable risk for this regime. A rush for a bomb does not, because the possibility that wide swathes of the Islamic Republic would then be reduced to an ashtray, then rise exponentially. Ladies and gentlemen, these guys are more actuaries than apocalypse now folk. What you learn in religious school in Qum is basically this, how to say the opposite on Tuesday 
of what you said on Monday. That's maddening, I know. It's the way Shia paper tigers strut their stuff. And what do real Sunni tigers with names like Al-Qaeda do? They attack and kill in London and New York. The real enemy is Sunni Salafism, not Shia malleability practiced in the service of a middle-aged revolution, cynical apparatchiks. Another word on context, this time the Middle East. I'm just back from Cairo's Tahrir Square and from Tunisia. This sudden Arab Spring is the most hopeful global development in two decades. Fraught with risk, yes, but promising to turn Arabs from the humiliated pawns of despots and a person who thinks his life is worth nothing is a ready candidate to be a jihadist into citizens with rights. I can report that there were three words I never heard in Tunis or Tahrir. One was Israel, the second was Islamism, and the third was Iran. This awakening is about Arab enfranchisement, period. For the Islamic Republic to try to claim that men and women from Benghazi to Bahrain are rising up in the name of Islam, let alone Iran's version of Islam, is just laughable. Arabs have noticed what happened to pro-democracy Persians in Tehran in 2009, and again, in fact, last week. And no thanks is their answer. Now, there's a notion around, and it was even in the New York Times today, and you may hear it from our opponents tonight, that all this, this Arab Spring, somehow benefits Iran because bullocks of the American Middle Eastern order, like Mubarak's Egypt or Al Khalifa's Bahrain, have been undermined. That, ladies and gentlemen, is dead wrong. The radical message of Iran has thrived on three things. The Western double standards behind US support for dictators like Mubarak, the frustration among subjugated Arab populations, and the festering Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Well, a resolution of the first two is now possible. It's at least conceivable. It remains to be seen what will happen with Israel-Palestine. I'm not going to go there. We'll be here for a week. Overall, I would say, without question, the changes in the region will undermine Iran's demagoguery. So please, ladies and gentlemen, try to flip around that subconscious image of those uncuddly mullahs and the bogeyman from central casting, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. They feel menacing, but could it be that what they really are is scared and that the oh-so-plodding nuclear program and the cultivation of Hezbollah in Lebanon, and all the ludicrous statements about the Holocaust and about building 20, 30, 40 new nuclear plants, they've never had one kilowatt of electricity from Boucher, really, are really about trying to build a moat, about raising the stakes for attacking Iran. In short, about nuclear and non-nuclear defensive posturing. That's what paper tigers do. They posture. Texans have an expression for it, all hat and no cattle. <laughs> Remember, the generation now in power is the generation that, that were young officers in the war against Iraq in the 1980s when one million died. They are haunted by the isolation Iran knew then. They're obsessed with another thing, the US and British overthrow in 1953 of the democratically elected Prime Minister Mossadegh, who had had the temerity to nationalize the oil industry. So the nuclear program does two things. It's a form of insurance, and it is to Iranian national pride what the oil industry was in the 1950s. But is it threatening? Well, I'll bore you quickly now in conclusion. I have a minute, I think, with a few technical details. Iran is still a signatory of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Inspectors are at Natanz. The low-enriched uranium it still has to be turned into high-enriched uranium. That would involve re-engineering all these centrifuges. Unless you think there's some Tom Clancy-like secret facility somewhere, we are still a very long way uh, from Iran having the possibility of a bomb. A lot of caricatures are around about Iran, and they betray ignorance. The Islamic Republic is a weak, divided, ideologically exhausted regime whose youthful population has parted company with its rulers. It will muddle along, building its nationalist stockpile, but never cross a line that would provoke immediate military attack. It will parade its postmodern media villains, but these villains will continue to embrace ambiguity over action. Iran is not ap apocalyptical, it is not genocidal, it has not initiated a war against a neighbor for more than two centuries. Iran Iranians are not, as Ruel Garecht, who will speak soon, has suggested, they do not have terrorism 
in their DNA. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.